it got to a point where it just felt like there had to be more and I needed to branch out. And so kind of against my parents' will, um, I applied for a boarding school. They were like, if you want to do it, then you've got to do it. So I did it. And um, so I went to boarding school in Massachusetts uh, for my sophomore year to senior year of high school. And then I went to Elon for college and did musical theater there. And really the track was to never come back. It was like, I'm never coming back to Georgia. Just life happens. I graduated school. I got my dream job um, in a Broadway tour and dream role, which I never even thought I could get. I thought I was never going to play that part. And um, it was just amazing. And so when your dreams kind of come true, you have a chance to reflect. And then some personal things happen, my family, some things happened to my family and my grandfather passed and I was getting older and I'm like, I've spent the last decade running away from my family when that's really all I want. And so then I moved back to Columbus, super depressed about it. It just forced me to make a new life for myself, which is like the best thing that ever happened. And I took a year off of all theater. I was like, I'm not doing anything. Because I needed to, I think, detach myself. I was so, like, un, like, unhealthily engaged in it. And so I was like, year off, you can't do anything. So I worked in a restaurant for a year. You know, I was just really, you know, mourning the loss of the life that I had wanted to live and that I thought was right for me and trying to figure out what was next was just really devastating in a lot of ways. I knew it was the right move, but you know, you spend your whole life being like, this is gonna be my life. And then realizing that it wasn't what you expected and having to give that up is just pretty, I mean, it was traumatizing. And um, you know, I have my own sort of, I think we all have our own sort of mental health issues, but mine just sort of like came to the forefront then. And I was really unhealthy and um, to the point where it's like I had to move home. I had to come home. And then I was just like, I've got to do something. I have to do something. My personal rock bottom is where the show came from because I just needed so desperately to do something. Well, I initially called RJ Theory RJ Theory because I was curious to see how it would work in Columbus. I was curious to see if something like this would, could actually float and people would like it. Um, and then as I started to develop the show, it became apparent that I was sort of working with all these sort of theories in my head about um, how the show would function. And then it, when it came down to it, I felt like it would be nice to share those. Countdown to testing. Three, two, one. Hypotheses one. A play can be devised from anything, including a Spotify playlist. Pop music, as an art form, doesn't get enough credit. 2. Fate, destiny, serendipity, kismet, karma, whatever, are all terms derived from some physical, measurable entity humans have yet to, and may never quantify. Hint, it's personified by two actors on stage. 3. Audiences don't need everything spelled out for them but it's less universal to leave things open to interpretation. 4. Most people don't want to sit through a two-hour play. 5. Aesthetic and visual appeal can override subtle nuances and lengthy dialogue, especially in a world that revolves around Instagram and social media. 6. The female voice is actively silenced in American culture and their needs are consciously ignored. 7. Columbus, Georgia, like many American cities, caters to a heteronormative community. And while we accept all people, we will never be a cultural hub until we are all actively seeking opportunities to celebrate the LGBTQ population. 8. The excuse that boys will be boys is alive and well. 9. Theater, among many art forms, will always struggle in regard to truthful racial representation. While art should be accessible, it is often a luxury reserved for those who can afford it. As long as systemic racism is a threat in our nation, we will struggle with representation. 10. You can't put a price on art. I knew I wanted to make something that was very viable today, that was would reach a lot of people and reach a demographic that I felt like wasn't represented, especially in the theater. 
and in Columbus. There's a lot of people who are working really hard to, just like I am, to further Columbus and make it better for people like me, I think, for the younger version of ourselves. Um, but in a lot of ways, it is the same. I feel definitely a lot of times on the outside, LGBTQ plus culture, it feels very isolating here. And I can't even imagine what it would be to be um, gender non-conforming in Columbus. That's pretty terif a pretty terrifying thought to me. And I envision living here for the rest of my life. But I also envision being able to live here and also spend a lot of time out of here to refresh. And I kind of hate that thought, that to live here, I have to leave to be able to live here. It's sort of a backwards, like, well, then why do you live here? Um, but I, there are things about Columbus that are just unlike anywhere else. I feel like I'm able to build something because there's not a lot of competition and I have a unique experience that's not here and a lot of that is fueled by my, you know, having grown up a gay man and knowing that forever. Um, so to me, I'm sort of like, this is the perfect place for me to be because I can just do. And there is that sort of like pushback a little bit that makes you be creative. I mean, that is a big story of r and is it was constant, like, no's, no, no, no. And so we had to, like, morph, and, and then there were these big yeses that were like, oh my god, thank god. Um, but yeah, I know in your face is probably the best creative juice you can get. <laughs> I knew Romeo and Juliet pretty well. Um, so I kind of knew what I was looking for, and the show just, like, I mean, it came out so quickly. And I think that's probably what came first, is I was like, what are the big, most important things I want to highlight? And so it became, I named the scene probably first, like the prologue, and then um, exposition, and then the Capulet Ball. And so all these things kind of fell into place. And there's a scene called Everything Goes Wrong. And that's because in my head I was like, okay, everything has to go wrong in this scene. I'm like, I don't know what happened, but this is the one where it like all explodes. And I just knew, like I knew what it was, what it was. And it, I think in like two weeks, I had the show like done. And then a week later, I had all the concepts, like I'd made all these character concepts. And then like a week after that, my mom <laughs> made me this whole set model just because people need to see it to believe it. I made little characters and I was plotting them out and seeing logistically, does it work? And in my brain, does it work? And then once I decided it did work, I just went full force with it. But I wanted it so overloaded that no matter what, at any given point, you're looking around and there's something to look at. It's different because it is so abstract in a lot of ways. Setting that we put it in, like the world that it lives in, where fashion sort of meets um, avant-garde, uh, that sort of world is different, and just the music is a whole character of this. I wanted to create new associations for people, and then I think people really attach to it. I'm actually really devastated. Like, I'm so sad right now. I'm, like, really in a state of, it sounds crazy, but I'm, like, mourning the loss of this thing that I had worked so hard on and that means so much to me, and it's over. And it's such a big part of my life. I mean, it's changed my life, and now I don't get it again.